let's begin with our second resource that is water. Water is also known as a wonder liquid. Water occupies a very large area of the earth's surface and is also found underground. Some amount of water exists in the form of water vapor in the atmosphere. Most of the water on earth's surface is found in seas and oceans and is saline. Fresh water is found frozen in the ice caps at the two poles and on snow covered mountains. The underground water and the water in the rivers, lakes and ponds is also fresh. All cellular processes take place in a water medium. All the reactions that take place within our body and within the cells occurs between substances that are dissolved in water. Substances are also transported from one part of the body to the other in a dissolved form. Hence, organisms need to maintain a level of water within their bodies in order to stay alive. Terrestrial life forms require fresh water for this because their bodies cannot tolerate or get rid of high amounts of dissolved salts in saline water. Hence, there is a need of easy access of water for animals and plants to survive on land. The availability of water decides not only the number of individuals of each species that are able to survive in a particular area, but it also decides the diversity of life there. Of course, the availability of water is not the only factor that decides the sustainability of life in a region. Other factors like the temperature and nature of soil also matters. So the three factors are availability of water, the temperature and nature of soil. But water is one of the major resources that determine life on land. Having said so much about water and its uses, try to imagine a situation where the pipeline supplies water in your locality bursts and you get to know that there will be no water supply for next two days. Try to figure out how difficult the situation will be without having any fresh water for next two days. Similarly, water pollution is also of great concern. Water dissolves the fertilizers and pesticides that we use on our farms. So what happens is, some percentage of these substances are washed into water bodies. Sewage from our towns and cities and the waste from factories are also dumped into rivers and lakes. Specific industries also use water for cooling in various operations and later return this hot water to water bodies. Another manner in which the temperature of the water in rivers can be affected is when water is released from dams. The water inside the deep reservoir would be colder than the water at the surface which gets heated by the sun. All this can affect the life forms that are found in these water bodies in various ways. It can encourage the growth of some life forms and harm some other life forms. This affects the balance between various organisms which had been established in that system. Moving forward, let's see the three types of water pollution that we can have. The first one is the addition of undesirable substances to water bodies. These substances could be the fertilizers and pesticides used in farming or they could be poisonous substances like mercury salts which are used by paper industries. This could also be disease causing organisms like the bacteria which causes cholera. The second is the removal of desirable substances from water bodies. We all know how important oxygen is for us for our survival. It is also equally important for marine species for survival. Any change that reduces the amount of this dissolved oxygen would adversely affect these aquatic organisms. Other nutrients could also be depleted from the water bodies causing water pollution. The third one is a change in temperature of the water. Aquatic organism, uh, organisms are used to a certain range of temperature in water body where they live. And a sudden marked change in this temperature would be dangerous for them or affect their breeding. The eggs and the larvae of various animals are particularly susceptible to temperature changes. Hence, it is not desirable to change the temperature of a region in water from its natural value. Moving on, let's see now the third uh, resource that is the soil. Soil is an important resource that decides the diversity of life in an area. 
but what is the soil and how is it formed? The outermost layer of our earth is called the crust and the minerals found in this layer supply a variety of nutrients to life forms. But these minerals will not be available to the organisms if the minerals are bound up in huge rocks. Over long periods of time, thousands and millions of years, the rocks at or near the surface of the earth are broken down by various physical, chemical and some biological processes. The end product of this breaking down is the fine particles which are called soil. Now let's see some factors that make soil. The first factor is the sun. The sun heats up the rock during the day so that they expand. At night, these rocks cool down and contract. Since all parts of the rock do not expand and contract at the same rate, this results in the formation of cracks and ultimately the huge rocks break into smaller pieces. The second important factor is water. Water helps in the formation of soil in two ways. The first one is water could get into the cracks in the rocks formed due to uneven heating by the sun. If this water later freezes, it would cause the cracks to widen. The second one is flowing water wears away even hard rock over long periods of time. Fast flowing water often carries big and small particles of rock downstream. These rocks rub against the other rocks and the resultant abrasion causes the rocks to wear down into smaller and smaller particles. The water then takes these particles along with it and deposits it further down its path. Soil is thus found in places far away from its parent rock. The next important factor is wind. In a process similar to the way in which water rubs against the rock and wears them down, strong winds also erode rocks down. The wind also carries sand from one place to the other like water does. And the last important factor is living organisms also influence the formation of soil. The lichen that we read about earlier also grows on the surface of rocks. While growing, they release certain substances that causes the rock, to, rock surface to powder down and form a thin layer of soil. Other small plants like moss are able to grow on the surface now and they cause the rock to break up further. The roots of big trees sometimes go into the cracks in the rocks and as the roots grow bigger, the crack is forced to grow bigger causing the rock to break down into smaller pieces. One thing to know is the soil is a mixture. It contains small particles of rocks, which are of different sizes. It also contains bits of decayed living organisms, which are called humus. In addition, soil also contains various forms of microscopic life. The type of soil is decided by the average size of particles found in it. And the quality of soil is decided by the amount of humus and the microscopic organisms found in it. Humus is a major factor in deciding the soil structure because it causes the soil to become more porous and allows water and air to penetrate deep underground. The mineral nutrients that are found in the particular soil depends on the rocks it was formed from. The nutrient content of a soil, the amount of humus present in it and the depth of soil are the some major factors that decide which plants will thrive on that soil. Thus. The topmost layer of the soil that contains humus and living organisms in addition to the soil particles is called the topsoil. The quality of topsoil is an important factor that decides biodiversity in an area. The excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides causes soil pollution. Use of these substances for long periods of time can destroy the soil structure by killing soil microorganisms that recycle nutrients in the soil. It also kills the earth forms which are instrumental in making the rich humus. Let us now look at the definition of soil pollution. Removal of useful components from the soil and addition of other substances which adversely affect the fertility of the soil and kill the diversity of organisms that live in it is called the soil pollution. The soil that we see today in one place has been created over very long period of time. However, some of the factors that created the soil in the first place and brought the soil to that place may be responsible for the removal of soil too. 
the fine particles of soil may be carried away by flowing water or wind. If the soil gets washed away and the rocks underneath are exposed, we have lost a valuable resource because plants require these soil to grow and very little will grow on the rocks that are exposed underneath. We will use a very simple experiment to show that plants are actually necessary to hold the soil in its place. We take two inclined planes and fill the top of it with soil. Now on one of the inclined planes we grow uh, some grass, on the other we don't grow anything. Now we start pouring water on top of both the inclined planes. In the first one where we have grown grass, we will see very little soil is flown away with the water. But in the second case, a large amount of soil is flown away with the water. This shows that plants are actually necessary to hold the soil together in its place. So the three resources we studied about were the air, the water and the soil. With this, we come to the end of the second video on this chapter. In the next video, we will be learning about various biogeochemical cycles and the ozone layer. Thank you.